Hello and welcome to Lunchtime Politics, reaching you live from our global headquarters here in the nation's commercial nerve center, Lagos. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. Here's what's coming up on the program. Military maintains its operations in Okwama, community of Delta State, and its environs continues until those responsible for killing of soldiers are apprehended and brought to justice. Support grows for the establishment of state police as the National Economic Council receives related memo from 16 state governors. An independent National Electoral Commission asks the media to seriously engage governorship aspirants and candidates ahead of the Edo and Ondo governorship polls. Thanks again for joining us on the weekend edition of the show. Let's start by telling you that the path towards establishing state police is getting clearer with the recent receipt of memoranda of uh, by 16 or from 16 governors. This was disclosed in a preliminary report submitted to the National Economic Council at its 114th meeting held virtually and chaired by the Vice President Kashim Shatima. The Vice President is urging state governors to prioritize the welfare of their people in designing policies. Our State House correspondent, Emperor Simon, reports. For a third time under the present administration, the National Economic Council is held virtually. Vice President Kashim Shatima chairs the meeting, which has in attendance state governors and some ministers, while some senior aides to the Vice President are in his conference room at the presidential villa to take notes. The Vice President calls for unity of purpose in addressing the challenges confronting the nation. We must remain consistent in implementing the initiatives that alleviate the suffering of our citizens and be accountable in doing so. We must also ensure that interventions we deploy are non-discriminatory and favor all stakeholders with no part of our communities or nation lagging behind. The council received reports of some of its committees, including the one on state policing. So far, according to the Secretary of the National Economic Council, only 16 states have submitted memorandum, 20 states and the FCTI yet to some send a report. Uh, but those states that did uh, indicated support for the establishment of state police. An abridged version of the report of the Committee on Crude Oil Theft Prevention and Control is also presented. Areas of leakages in the oil industry are identified. Activities in the industry, production, flow station, pipeline and shipment were monitored. And cases of, of serious infrastructure infractions were observed. Meanwhile, the federal government is targeting to empower over a million young Nigerians with digital skills. That IDICE program, as we term it, is worth $617 million. And um, the important impact that it will have is that it will create about uh, uh, um, 1.3 million jobs for young people. The report of the country's account as of March, as presented during the meeting, shows that the excess crude account is about $500,000. The stabilization account is 33.8 billion naira, and natural resources account is 114 billion naira. NEC also received briefing from Governor Abdurrahman Abdurazak of Kwara State, who is the chairman of the newly inaugurated Committee on Economic Affairs that is saddled with the responsibility of looking into issues of access to economic opportunities, tackling current challenges, reviewing infrastructure's deficit, as well as insecurity. From the Presidential Villa, Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. In the meantime, as we continue to track development in the Okuama killing incident, the army has vowed that it will not rest until those behind the death of 17 soldiers in the Delta community are fished out. It's why the Nigerian army is soliciting the assistance of the people of the area with information that will lead to the apprehension of the perpetrators and of their weapons. The general officer commanding 6th Division of the Nigerian Army, Port Harcourt, Major General Jamal Abdul Salam, said this when the management of the Niger Delta Commission, NDDC, visited him to condole with the Nigerian army over the incident. 
On March the 16th, Nigerians woke up to the horrific news of the killing of 17 soldiers which occurred in the Nokuama community, Delta State, where they'd gone to restore peace following a communal clash between border communities. Investigations have been launched into the incident and how the soldiers met their untimely death. Notwithstanding, the army is resolute in its determination to apprehend those involved in the killing. The GOC 6th Division, Major General Jamal Abdul Salam, reiterated the Army's stance during a condolence visit by the Executive Board members of the Niger Delta Development Commission, led by the Managing Director Samuel Lubuku, to the military formation. Our mission is to get our weapons that we can't get away by the criminals back and to arrest all those, all those that took part in the gruesome murder of our officers and soldiers. Therefore, we are going to be in great sum until those objectives are met. For us, the NDDC Managing Director pledges the agency's continued support for the military to sustain peace and development within the Niger Delta as the NDDC extends aid to the families of the slain officers. For us and the people of the Niger Delta, I can assure you that we are in solidarity with the Nigerian Army for keeping the peace in the Niger Delta. And at this point, where your morning, we thought we also have to mourn with you. The GLC thanks his visitors for their support and gives assurances that the army will remain firm, decisive, and professional in its operations. No harm will come to anybody. We will continue to conduct our operations in a very professional manner. We are to communities to assist us with information regarding the location of our weapons and the location of these fleeing criminals. Because if you have information on these issues and you give them, you are also an accessory to be asked. A minute silence is held in honor of the slain soldiers. Meanwhile, the Delta State Governor, Sheriff Oboroware, has cautioned traditional rulers in the state against shielding those involved in the killing of the military personnel in the Kwama community. Governor Borowara gave the warning while meeting with traditional rulers at the state's Traditional Rulers Council Secretariat in Asaba, the Delta State Capital. He described the act as barbaric, inhumane, and unacceptable, vowing that the perpetrators of the crime must be found and made to face justice. Those people who are committed as evil acts was this. That is the focus of our conversation. The incident in Okoama community and the action or the operations of the army to ensure that the perpetrators are brought to book as well as recovery of their weapons. We're being joined in the program for this conversation uh, by a retired U.S. Army Captain, Captain Bish Johnson. Uh, joins us via Zoom. Captain Johnson, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Th thank you for having me and good afternoon. Absolutely. So let's, uh, there, there are so many sides to this story. In fact, 
it's almost difficult to hold on to any of the story. But the facts are 17 soldiers were killed, including senior officers. There are emerging stories now unconfirmed that even civilians are becoming casualty. The area has been cordoned off. These are things we could speak to. Um, but as to how this came to be is really difficult as to what all the narratives we're looking at. So from your perspective, um, how best should the army handle this situation? Okay. Um, again, thank you for having me. Um, I listened to uh, the comments from the GOC in charge of 6th Division, Port uh, in which they said that he said that their uh, primary objective is to make sure that the perpetrators of that barbaric acts are, you know, captured and arrested, and that the army will remain resolute and uh, professional. I have also read a um, um, press release from the army spokesperson, Brigadier General Onye Mawachuku, in which he had categorically denied that the army is carrying out any form of repressal attack. Um, I would tend to believe uh, what those high-ranked military officers are saying, unless there's anybody who has that um, credibility who can come out and uh, you know disprove what these people are saying. So the best way the army can proceed with this is what they are saying, that they will remain professional. And for them to remain professional, it means that they will have to follow laid down rules and regulations and policies on how to carry out investigation when incidents of this nature occur. I know that there is no scenario in Nigeria that happens today that is not covered by our law. There are various laws on the book when service members are killed by civilians or civilians are killed by service members, armed robbers, bandits, or whatever the case may be. There's always an agency established by law and saddled with the responsibility of carrying out investigation under any of those circumstances. And those are what the same thing obtains in the most advanced countries. And I'll give you a typical example. If this would have been the United States, although such thing has never happened, where citizens kill their own soldiers, uh, being that they are soldiers, they work for the federal government, is now a federal crime. So the FBI will now have to take over the investigation of that matter. Of course, with the support of the military, and support of local law enforcement agencies in the state and also the local area where that incident took place. But the lead agency will be the FBI because a crime has been committed and they are the ones saddled with the responsibility of investigating crimes. I know the army is hurt and I know that they are determined to make sure they get justice for their you know, fellow, um, uh, for their comrades, their colleagues, um, who in, have been murdered in this fashion while on the line of duty. Uh, but the best way to do it is to do what they say they are going to do, and which is to remain professional. And if they remain professional, they will get to the bottom of this matter. But if they derail from being professional, and begin to administer collective punishment in the community where this thing happened. Because you have to understand, not everybody in that community was involved in that act. They may be shielding or withholding information from the military or any other relevant government agency that is investigating this matter because of past antecedents where information had been volunteered to security agencies and intelligence agencies. And and then arrest is made, prosecution done, and those who are sent to prison and only for them to be released just a few years after, and they come back and start haunting those who had provided information. So there's a delicate balance for the military to follow here, in which they will have to gain the trust of the people to be able to get relevant information from them as to who and the whereabouts of those who had committed this crime. The villagers know who did this thing. They have that information. But the only way they can volunteer that information is if they are given absolute assurance 
that no evil is going to befall them uh, before them if they provide that information now not tomorrow not a day after and not in any any right. any time in the future okay uh, th there are layers to this issue right now um the fact that which is my direct question should the army even lead this investigation given the, the fact that they are directly affected maybe they may be clouded by emotion even though they say they'll be professional as much as possible because the police can't get in the media can't get in the governor can't get in so if there are reports of any other action that may be extrajudicial uh nobody can really find out it's all going to be all allegations and all of that so the first question in situations like this you have been in a broader space should the army even lead uh in this 21st century this time around and what happens to these innocent people that we understand are trapped in the bush and uh, haven't had access to food in the last one week or six days now if you listen to my um opening remark i uh, began by telling you how it's done in some sane uh, societies you see we have a lot of conversation to have in this country as to what ought to be the role of the nigerian military in civil space um you know time and again the nigerian military has been assuming too much of internal security of nigeria at the detriment of the nigerian police you see there's a difference between soldiering and policing their trainings are different and so the military does not have that training to begin to carry out forensic investigations you know as to be able to determine who the the um, perpetrators of this crime might be the police is the one who is saddled with that responsibility they have the training they have the equipment you know to figure out who did this thing in a very sane society is going to require a lot of forensic analysis that's going to involve some lab testing and all that stuff to make sure that at the end of the day no innocent person will suffer for what they did a, a, a crime they didn't commit and so ordinarily ordinarily the nigerian police ought to be the one leading this investigation because that is their area of jurisdiction irrespective of who is involved and i so stated it earlier that if it was in the united states regardless of the fact that the soldiers are involved it is the responsibility of the fbi to lead this investigation and get those who are responsible arrested and prosecuted so, and similar so, thing ought to be so happening captain, here in nigeria because the so, nigerian police yes so, so sorry for butting in. So, Captain, uh, our thoughts and our prayers, and it's totally condemnable what was done to those uh, senior officers and those junior officers, uh, all the military officers that were killed. Nobody accepted it. It's totally condemnable. But the action that has been seen now uh, from your own, uh, you said it, would you describe it as overreaching or just a Nigerian thing? Well, the action from which party? From the I mean, military, from the you mean? Ordering off of the area, people can access the area, people trapped in the bush. They say they are going to get to the bottom. They are not leaving until they unravel all of this. Yes. Yes, I think that would be too high handedness on the part of the military. There's absolutely no reason to cordon off the entire community. This is unnecessarily a collective punishment for the people of uh, Akuma community because not all of them are involved in this crime. And the military, whether they like it or not, they're going to have to rely on these people to be able to get to the bottom of this matter. They are the ones that have the intelligence information that will assist the military to make sure that the right people are apprehended. It's not a matter of apprehending people. It's a matter of apprehending the people who actually committed this barbaric and condemnable act. So the, to cordon off the area and prevent movement of even the press the media because that is why nobody is able now to ascertain the true situation of things in the area is because both the military the press is not being let into the community you know to report on what is going on there i don't know how true that is i'm not a member of the media so i i don't know whether the media has access to the community or not but if what we are hearing is true the military is not proceeding as they have said they will because proceeding professionally does not require them to cordon off the area just you know prevent people who are already in the bush from returning home those who are supposed to be providing them with intelligence information prevent the governor of the state from getting access to the community prevent the media from getting access to the community prevent the police that ordinarily is supposed to be the lead agency in this investigation 
from having access to that community. If that is what is happening, they are proceeding in a wrong way. And at the end of the day, we may not be able to get to the bottom of this matter. Like I said, it's not about arresting people. It's about arresting those who committed the crime. In this 21st century, in this 2024, I am thinking that we have grown beyond the point where we assign collective punishment for a crime or offense that is committed by a few individuals. I don't think that that's what we ought to be doing. So in your view, when now I know you, you, you serve in the, the, your vets in the U.S. Army, but this is our reality. And perhaps this is how we operate here. Uh, perhaps we still have the memory of Zaki Biam and Odin ahead. So you can see why people are a bit apprehensive. At what point should the military begin to step back and be a bit cautious so that they don't lose the goodwill they are enjoying today? Because it's a delicate balance we must admit. The time for them to step back is now. Now, when I say step back, I am not saying that they should give up the investigating, investigating the matter, but they need to be able to step back a bit, allow professionals in investigation, which is the Nigerian police, to gain access to the area and collect forensic evidence. I'm very sure that you know the, the crime scene had already been corrupted because they are not forensic investigators. They are not trained to do that. They are not police people. It's police that can do that, you know, and they should step back but, and provide adequate support for the lead agency, which is the Nigerian police. I understand there is some kind of trust issue between those uh, agencies, but the truth of the matter is that, look, the law is quite clear on who is in charge of internal security and it's the Nigerian police. And so they ought to be at the forefront in this investigation. If our objective truly is to get to the bottom of the situation, which is to find and apprehend the real people, the actual people who committed the crime. So that's what ought to happen. And they should also allow the, those citizens and natives of that community, those who are hiding in the bushes, to return home. Because they, at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to provide the valid intelligence that we need to the arrest of these people that we are talking about. The media should also be allowed to go in there and report on the true situation of things. You know, they can't do it heavy handedly like that because if they're making mistakes, which most times they will make mistakes, there will be nobody to point out the mistakes that they are making and they will continue in error and that will derail the whole entire support of the Nigerian population that which they are enjoying as we speak. Captain, your insights is quite up. Captain uh, Bishop Johnson, retired U.S. Army captain, thank you so much for coming through and uh, providing perspective on this particular very delicate issue uh, as far as your Kwama community killing is concerned. Thank you for, very much for coming on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Absolutely. Now to politics. The chairman of the Independent National, not politics, now election management, I should say, the election uh, umpire, the electoral umpire, and the leader of that commission, Professor Mahmoud Yakubu, is asking media organizations to engage with political parties, aspirants, and give an in-depth report of their activities. Professor Mahmoud made the appeal during a consultative meeting with media executive in Abuja ahead of the Edo and Ondo elections. I urge media organizations to engage with political parties as well as their aspirants and report on the primaries with the same diligence and depth you report on the main election conducted by INEC. Doing so will go a long way to strengthen our democracy since only the products of the party primaries are ultimately placed on the ballot paper for citizens to vote for in the main election. Party primaries are as important as the main election conducted by INEC. That's why the elections are called primary elections. INEC conducts the secondary election. A very important reality in today's age of information technology is the spread of fake news and misinformation instantly and on a global scale. As I said on many occasions, INEC does not believe in censorship. 
the best antidote to fake news is greater openness and transparency. It is in furtherance of this policy that the Commission interfaces regularly with stakeholders through our regular consultative meetings. We appreciate our partnership with the media, and I want to reassure you that ANEC will continue to work very closely indeed with you. Well, we have a breaking news coming in uh, from Nasarawa State that at least two students of the Nasarawa State University in Kefi have lost their lives with 23 others hospitalized during the distribution. You can see that crowd of distribution of policies at the school premises. Confirmed sources say the crowd at the distribution venue in Kefi resulted in a stampede. Uh, the Nasarawa State Government at early in the week launched in the distri distribution of palliatives to students of the tertiary institutions in the state. However, about 9,000 students from the tertiary institutions in Lafia and Akwanga are said to have received palliatives in the course of the week without any itch. Uh, some students said the distribution exercise may have gone haywire owing to the strike by Sanu and Nasu. So we can tell you that two students in this very difficult uh, situation that we're seeing uh, the students have to go through to get palliatives they find they just lost their lives and 23 others have been hospitalized due, due to uh, their push and turns that led to a stampede and now two persons have been reported dead in that particular uh, university in Nasarawa state in Kefi. Quite a very sad development. Uh, our thoughts and our prayers are with the families of these students. Uh, we're, we're following that story. As soon as we get more detail, we'll bring it up to you. But let's also tell you that the president of the Senate, Goswil Akbabio, has arrived in Geneva, Switzerland, for the 148th Swiss uh, Assembly of Interparliamentary Union, IPU. Uh, Senator Akbabio as head of Nigeria's delegation to the IPU, was accompanied on the trip by the Deputy Speaker of the House of Representatives, Mr. Benjamin Kalu and Senator Sukwa Ekbayong from Cross River State. According to a statement by a Special Assistant on Media, uh, Mr. Jackson Udom, this year's edition will take place from the 23rd to the 27th of March, which is tomorrow. At the last edition of the IPU, which held in Luanda, Angola, Nigeria, broke a 59-year-old jinx when Senator Akwabia was elected into the Executive Committee of the Global Parliamentary Body. The last time Nigeria had the privilege to be in the Executive Committee of the IPU was in 1964. And again, just before we wrap up the program for the day and the week, let's tell you that two students of the Nasarawa State University in Kefi have died following um, some stampede that occurred during the distribution of palliatives at the school premises. 23 of them right now are, been, are in the hospital trying to receive medical attention. So the government had started distributing palliatives to tertiary institutions, and this is what eventually became the fallout of that. Sanu Nasu are on strike, so people are suspecting that this could also be a reason for the need uh, for some level of support for the students. So, but unfortunately, two students have died following this particular incident. What a day. Oh, thank you so much for your time and your company and being part of the program. I wish you a very happy weekend. I'm Jeffrey Uzama. You've been served on lunchtime.